Welcome to a Saturday morning crime time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace edition. We are two retired New York City police detectives. And if you like all things true crime related from that police detective's perspective, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you'll get all things Duty Ron and Ed Wallace when we go live or upload another video. Today, this morning here, we're going to talk to you about the new evidence in the University of Idaho case that's been released by the media from their sources. Uh, so again, let's take this all with a grain of salt. But before we get into that, I want to say a special thank you to Patreon supporters, channel members, and all the folks who replay, view, and positively engage. Ed and I appreciate you uh, tremendously for the engagement here on the channel. Ed, you're in Bangkok. How's it going over there? 11 o'clock at night, hanging out with us on a Saturday morning here in America. Yes, yes, it's going well. It's going well. I'm getting acclimated here. Yes, it's Bangkok, uh, not Beijing. Okay, yeah. right? I'm not in. I'm not in China. There <laughs> we go. I messed that up. Yeah, you know what? Thanks for <laughs> pointing that out. I had a. I had to edit that video to mess. I. I was actually. I was stating that from um, uh, Hangover. They. They did a funny skit where they made a mention of that when they said, "What's the capital of?" Of, of China. And he said, he answered it. Alan answered it, Bangkok. So that was the reference. Right. I was making, but nobody well, hangover that. too was filmed here. There you go. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but yeah. So Melbourne, Australia, Judy McNamara uh, McNair is saying hello to you. M Mel's Panda. Everybody is saying hello to Ed Wallace. People are laughing. Look, Allison, Ed Wallace fangirl. She never changed her screen name. She's still your fangirl. Uh, Dawn Marie is here and Sleuthy, uh, of course, Sleuthy has to, she's checking in because She's uh, well invested in this case. She's done some great stuff on her timelines. Um, there's a couple of page document on her Twitter that um, walks you through uh, all of the steps in, let me put myself back on. It walks you through all the steps uh, from uh, early on in this case, straight through. So if you wanna just take a peek at that, I watched it and I looked at it this morning. It was pretty good. But Ed, how's the, um, How's everything going over there? I know you're all settled in, but it's a 12 hour time difference. Uh, you, did you catch up on sleep or, or, or are you still behind a little bit and uh, talk, talk to the audience about a little, what, what it's a like there? Behind. It was, it's a, it was a long trip. Um, you know, it, it was like four, 14 to 15 hours from um, JFK to uh, Korea and then five hours from Korea to Bangkok. Um, and, you know, it was a little tough getting acclimated um, in the first couple of days. Uh, so I'm on day three here in country. Um, so running around, taking care of business, going over uh, to um, meeting uh, points of contact here and doing uh, what we need to do to get ready to start work on Monday. So you're there uh, conducting Army training, as I say, oh, Army training, sir. Uh, so, yeah, Ed is yes. he's there teaching. He's, um, you know. Uh, on assignment, if we could put it that way, I, I had a few people email me. Um, the, these are the wide vary of questions about you, Ed Wallace. Is Ed Wallace part of the CIA? Is Ed Wallace an undercover operative? Um, is he special ops? Is he military? Yes, is, uh, I'm, I'm, yes, I do all these things and I jump on the internet and do this. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm not any of those things. Hey, there you go. Well, I just I figured I'd you know let the audience in on some of the behind the scenes stuff uh, inquiries that I get in regards to Ed Wallace, but. Um, be that as it may, you and I have been talking, you know, a little bit and being that you're, you know, so far uh, away, it's hard to kind of communicate. But, you know, we 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 got up to speed on and I hate to even share, um, you know, Banfield stuff because nowadays she's been on my like nerves. Like I've had about this much of Banfield, like up to here uh, with sensationalizing uh, Karen uh. North. Yeah, it's just uh, I've had it. I've had it up to here with Banfield, but unfortunately, we have to play a clip from her because last night she released some sources. Right again, these are sources, and and folks, there's a lot of people who, and I'm not saying this is 100, percent but there's a lot of people who want to get their five minutes of fame. They want to they want to get on the internet. They want their story put out there, just like we see on Facebook, and people are sending out their narratives on what they think happened, what they propose ha has happened here. I'm not saying that her sources are fake book people or whatever, um, but 
Ed and I agree that you have to very well vet your sources before you put stuff like this out. We have a gag order. It doesn't apply to the media, but let's take a listen. It's going to be painful, but let's take a listen to this two and a half minutes of um, Danfield because she goes over some stuff that I want to talk to you guys with Ed Wallace about. And you know what? Two minutes plus of playing Banfield, I would rather listen to Ed talk, but we got to listen to this and we're going to get, we're going to get this out. And then Ed and I are going to give you our thoughts on this. So here we go. And welcome to this Thursday edition of Banfield. I want to begin with some breaking news on the Idaho murder case. A couple of sources with knowledge of the investigation have told News Nation some details that up until now we did not know. Let me lay a few of these details out, but I do want to warn you that this is graphic information and it is uncomfortable to hear this because we're talking about innocent kids who were killed in that home um, back in October. And not only that, um, this is evidence that likely will come out in court at some point. Uh, Whether it will be germane to who the killer is or not, that remains to be seen but it could be evidence nonetheless. With that in mind, let me let you know uh, what these sources have told News Nation. Uh, number one, they told us that um, the victims, uh, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan, were killed first, and they confirmed that Ethan Chapin and Zana Kernodal were killed on the second floor afterwards. And these are some of the other details that they have released. They said that Ethan Chapin was killed in the doorway of Zana Kernodal's room before the killer set upon Zana. Uh, The sources say that it appeared Ethan had stepped partly into the hallway where the attack may have begun. Um, These sources also say that Ethan Chapin suffered a slash to the neck. But I have to say that both of these details are in direct conflict with what the coroner had originally told us right here on this program exclusively. And also, they conflict directly with what police have said as well. And those two facts that are in conflict are that all of the victims were in their beds, according to police and the coroner. And according to the coroner, all of the injuries were stab wounds and not slash wounds. So I just want to play for you exactly what it was the coroner said in her words. Were any of them uh, slashed? Were, were any of their necks cut? Um, or were these all puncture wounds? Well, it was a pretty large knife, so it's really hard to call them puncture wounds. And they were definitely stabbings. Uh, can you tell me, when you say that they might have been sleeping, were they found in beds? Um, yes. So those uh, were the facts that the coroner told us. And like I said, it is in direct conflict with what these two sources familiar with the investigation are now telling us as well. That obviously needs to be sorted out and likely best in a court of law as well. Also want to tell you these other details that um, we have learned from these two sources that Zana Kernodal put up a fierce fight when the attacker set upon her, repeatedly grabbing the attacker's knife, so much so that she sustained deep cuts to her fingers and that her fingers were nearly severed. Now, that does actually work in comport with what Zana's father had reported to an Arizona news outlet about what he knew. Thank you for watching. Go to newsnationnow.com. Okay. All right, let's save that. Ed, I want to go directly to you. What you what are your thoughts on what she just put out here, Ed? She shouldn't have put this out. All right. She had two unconfirmed sources, right? And how do we know that she really did have these sources? Okay. And and whoever these sources are, if they turned out to be true and to be law enforcement, um, they should be identified and punished. Okay. Uh, th- this information uh, should, should not have been aired. Uh, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. All right. You know, this can impact the, um, the, the case itself going, going to trial. Well, you know, it, 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 she has to bear some responsibility for this, okay? And for, first of all, let's go back to the medical examiner or the coroner. The coroner should never have given that interview and said the things that she said, okay? Right. And that was that November should, 17th. That was just days after this uh, homicide. Right. Occurred. And we have information 
uh, and descriptions of how the inside of the crime scene appeared in the affidavit that was released um, for the warrants. Right. Okay. So uh, I, I don't understand. I, I, you know, this is totally irresponsible in, in my, in my opinion. You know, and I, I, I agree. And I want to expand on that because the public's uh, wants and needs should be come second because what this case is about is Ethan Chapin, Zana Canodal, and Kaylee Gonzalez, Maddie uh, Mogan, right? It's not about wanting to hear the information prematurely before it comes out. And listen, if somebody from the crime scene, um, uh, you know, whether it's from the uh, Idaho State Crime Lab, you, we saw the females and males that were out at the scene. Uh, I'm not saying that this is where the, her sources came from, but the only people that would have knowledge of that inside of that home is the first responders that responded there, the EMS and paramedics, crime scene investigators, and anyone that's been in that location. Uh, nobody else well, should be- well, the people, Like the other college students that were called initially and, and uh, went inside that uh, location. Right, but okay. we aren't 100% um, sure whether they went in there or not. You know, they might have seen something mm -hmm. and ran out and backed out. She's talking about intimate details of fingers almost being severed, on uh, Zana Canodal, uh, this is the kind of stuff, and I got to bleep myself because I'm going to curse. This is the kind of that shouldn't get out there. This stuff should yeah. not be out there. It should be presented at, by the prosecution before a jury, and that's it. So this is where it gets me. It gets me livid because who is now standing to be to 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 get hurt by this? The people who do not have a voice anymore, the four victims who were brutally the slain, right? And the so, and and the and the people. Yeah. You remember, a prosecution is brought on behalf of the people of of that community. It, you know, when you look at the indictments and you look at it, it's the people of the state of New York versus the defendant. In this case, it's the people of the state of Idaho versus this defendant. And so those people, those those people of that community get hurt as well if this case goes south because of nonsense like this. Right. And I, and I want to show for the audience, and I'm not going to play this because this is another five minutes that we would be wasting and not being able to talk to Ed Wallace outside the country. But I, I have to show this because on, on or about the same time she released that, this is another five minute video that she did. And it says here breaking news right so in addition to that piece that we just showed you she doubled down with the second piece and says sources xana was killed last and fought back and look she's got joseph scott morgan and uh this houston retired houston homicide detective um and, and she goes on for five minutes talking about more intimate details on this case now i don't know about you ed but i do know actually about you this has me livid this, this kind of stuff is just completely, completely unnecessary. And we've already seen her exploit Zana Kernodal's uh, biological mom, uh, Kara Northington, and she did it on two and uh, actually three separate nights. And she even made a rebuttal video to all of the backlash that she got for putting Zana Kernodal's mother on her program. Um, so... This, this kind of stuff, it just gets, it just eats me alive because we lose focus of what is really important. And it's the four victims, their, their names, and those are the ones that are, do not have a voice now. And we need to get justice, whether, you know, Brian Kohlberger is innocent and proven guilty. We all know that, right? We listen to many criminal defense attorneys, Joe Murray included, I had on the program where we talk about everyone's afforded the presumption of innocence. So um, I know that most people here in the live chat and we want, Ed and I want to know what you think, right? I want to just ask you guys in the live chat, put a one if you feel that this is uh, unethical kind of reporting and put a two in the chat if you do not have a problem with it. And don't be shy because if you don't have a problem with it, we respect it. But I'll have to say, we respectfully disagree with your, with your opinion and your stance. Ed? You know how I feel. It, it, this should not have been aired. Again, I keep, I'll keep. i say it again. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And yeah. I would think ethics, there should be some ethics in journalism, um, you know, that you don't do things like this. 
Okay. Uh, well, you know, I mean, is it just to get the views? Obviously it is, right? It's, it's you know, to get the viewership, right? The, it's like clickbait on the internet. All right. Uh, so, <sighs> yeah. I mean, you have to, you have to understand how this type of reporting can impact that trial. Yeah. And look at this statement by Roxy Diesel. Uh, she says, wow, look at all the number ones. And, and you know what? Here, Shannon Gray, the attorney for Steven Gonzalez, he sent uh, on the 5th, on yesterday, January 5th, he went to the court and he put in a request to be excluded from the gag order. Now, I... I I'm not an attorney, and I always say, Ed and I, we stay in our lane, but we do call the balls and strikes, as Ed says, right? Um, I don't know what his motivation would be to want to have a mouthpiece. The His client's daughter's uh, alleged killer is going to trial, right? So what is the upside to holding news conferences, and what are you going to talk about? I mean, Ed, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the attorney that represents the, uh, you know, the Gonzalez family, um, but I, I mean, I'm going to ask some of my attorney friends because I don't see an upside for him wanting to have that gag order uh, up, up, you know, relieved for, for him and others who want to speak because if they relieve it for him then every family is going to be able to speak. And I don't think any of them want to jeopardize this case. What do you think? And they shouldn't. And they shouldn't. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, he's, he's, um, he's been out there um, talking for quite some time until this gag order shut them down. Right. And, you know, um, again, you know, even, even family members have to understand how what they say and do can impact this trial going forward. Right. And, you know, it's not really anybody's job to understand how the wheels of justice move, but we know it. And so do attorneys. So I would I would just kind of uh, say that I want to kind of try to understand why he did that. And it has to be some type of reasoning behind it, because most uh, uh, attorneys um, have their clients best interests at heart. Right. So having uh, Shannon Gray speak before this perpetrator was taken into custody, he was representing the family and he wanted them to have a voice and have a, their say. But now that there's somebody in custody, I don't see the upside to him being able, and, and I, I think the judge is gonna just deny it, to be honest with you, and that's my uh, opinion. I could be wrong. I'm gonna ask uh, Joe Murray. Uh, I'm gonna ask Andrea. Um, going to go to the lawyer you know. Mark Prince, thank you for becoming a member or coming back to the memberships. And Dr. Ed Moskowitz, again, thank you for the super chat. Thank you very much, Duty Ron and Ed. We miss you. We love and respect you. Dr. Ed, this is re reprehensible, these poor families. So that's coming from Dr. Ed, and I'm sure Julie is close by. So thank you, Dr. Ed and Julie, for the super chat. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's just this thing is getting out of control and, and we're not even close to June yet. What what you know, we, we have our seatbelts buckled. What what are, what are we going to get next? Are we going to get someone that makes a recreation of how these murders took place and start posting it online or having these guys talk about it? I mean, I, I, I hope and pray that that doesn't happen. But, you know, what where do where does this end? Where does this stop? It's crazy. Um, it stops when somebody is held responsible for it. Yeah. Well, again, we we have to say to ourselves, you want to you want to respect the order of the court and the order of the court is not to be mean and not to hold back information from us, the general public. And we all are curious. Right. Who here doesn't want to know what happened uh, on that evening, that morning uh, of the 13th? Who here doesn't want to know what happened to these poor kids, uh, young adults, 20 and 21 years old? Um, it's human nature to want to know that. But if you get that information out and too many people start talking about things, the, here's where you taint the potential jury pool. And I don't think that it's, um, I don't think that it's uh, appropriate at this time. Um, so here, here's a good one. I got to highlight this. And Ed, I know you had a thought, so I don't want you to lose it. Sleuthy Goosey says, Banfield should take call-ins on our show. 
I don't I, think that. I don't know how well. that would work. She she cuts off her guests that are on her show uh, all the time. You know, yeah. how would that work? How would call in? So she would just hang up on people that uh, she doesn't agree with or like, uh, you know, what they're saying or. Right. It seems like if you don't shake your head and agree with her, uh, her narrative or her, or her point of view, then uh, you get cut off. And we saw that with uh, a couple of people. Uh, a lot of people are laughing. Um, Kristen, let's unpack that. She's laughing. Ali D, Dawn Marie, um, a whole bunch of folks are. Uh, it, look, it, it seems like everybody's on the same page. And I know that there's a lot of people that feel like, hey, more is good, more is better. And that's not the case. Not with a quadruple murder, not with a sing, you know, not with a singular. Uh, if it was these, if it was just one person that was murdered, it still wouldn't make it right. Um, and and for me. Uh, I take this sign out. I've been taking it out too much lately, but maybe I should hang this up in the background. So let me go full full screen with this. This is Jagalunism 101, and it's coming from a, a, a bona fide news source that I, I up until recently, really enjoyed uh, the news coverage on News Nation. But unfortunately, the hits just keep coming, and and that's what's troubling to me. Ed, they talk about in that in that piece. Um, uh, Zana's boyfriend, uh, Ethan Chapin, um, being uh, being murdered the last. Uh, and I don't want to I- expand on this stuff, but I have to ask you this: If somebody was to put that kind of information out again, I did say it. I touched on it earlier. Um, it would have to be somebody from either the crime scene unit or somebody close in on this investigation or had information that was heard. You know civilians are around a lot of these police professionals could it have been a civilian source that leaked this thing out who knows we don't know but inside information details like that if they are in fact true nobody knows that with the exception of whoever was inside that crime scene yeah yeah um yeah so you know, and, and 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 you know like i said now see this would open up an internal affairs investigation in the NYPD all right. They would be looking at all these people that were in that crime scene from law enforcement um, and, you know, raking them over the coals to see uh, who um, potentially uh, were, quote unquote, sources, if right. you can believe that. Or, yeah. if, you know, I mean, because just because the press says they had sources, you know, if they're not pressed to give up their, their sources and a lot of time their sources are protected. Right. On the on the First Amendment and and all these things with the press, um, you know, to. Sometimes, you know, there have been cases where um, courts got involved and asked reporters to give up their sources and they wouldn't give them up. And then some reporters went to jail and, and then were released and others, you know, never were gave them up. We don't know if there is, in fact, any any, you know, two sources or whatever the case may be. Uh, right. It's it's just crazy. You know, again, now again, now, if there is an internal affairs investigation on this. Think how that impacts the case. Right. Yeah, because the defense attorney has a field day with that. Uh, and that's the sad part about it is that not only does it impact the case, you can have um, more ammunition as a criminal defense attorney to show that there's no integrity to the investigation. In other words, this stuff has to be secretive. And we saw how Moscow PD, uh, and I'm giving them kudos here because they did not lead anybody on to believe that they had anybody on their radar. In fact, they doubled down by saying a 2011 to 2013 uh, Hyundai Elantra, when in fact, two weeks into this thing, they kind of knew that it was a 2015 Elantra. They didn't want to, uh, and this is my personal opinion, they didn't want to spook the suspect. Um, and, and they probably had close eyes on them. I'm hoping and praying, but now again, going back, circling back to poor news reporting, they reported that, um, through a person who's penning a book on these murders, uh, the, he, he had an FBI source that said for 15 hours, they lost sight of Brian Kohlberger, um, as he traveled across the country in that obscure route that he took. Uh, and, and, and again, that's not something should, that should be publicly consumed because that just gives more, um, that gives more fuel to the defense's fire. And who are we looking for to help here? 
Are we looking to help? And the who's bags? the source? Who's the source of that information? Unknown source. Unknown. I did a full yeah. video on it, Ed, and I, I, I don't get pissed off a lot. But uh, let me tell you something. My, my voice when I did that it was like, "What the hell is going on?" That's what how I felt. I mean, my voice went so low. It's like I turned into a monster because I was so pissed about that. You know, you have someone who's penning a book or writing a docu series or whatever. The Frick, you want to call it, uh, and News Nation is putting it out there, and all of the other news, uh, MSNBC had it, CNN, they all ran with this thing that the F breaking news, the FBI lost Kohlberger for fifteen hours. I was like, oh my god, when is this going to end? Ed, you think we should take a couple of questions from the audience? Sure. All right, so listen, just got, so you guys know, it's 11.28 p.m. for Ed Wallace, so Saturday night going into Sunday morning. Um, and uh, so we can't, we're not going to probably stay for the full hour here, but I, I, I want to go to you guys and ask you what you guys are thinking. And Amber ATS News uh, put up a, uh, a, good, uh, a good comment, and I highlighted it, but I lost it. But Amber says, um, Ed and Ron, what do you think? Do you think um, Banfield paid these people to give the information to them? Or do you think it was just someone that came and volunteered? We have no, I'll, I'll answer that because we have no way of knowing. We don't, we have no way of knowing. I know I appeared on Banfield uh, once or twice, twice actually. Um, and I didn't get paid for it. Um, and it was during the Gonzalo Lopez um, caper. Gonzalo Lopez was the inmate who um, was wanted for, uh, you know, he was in custody for felony murder and he was on, going to get the death penalty i believe on death row and he got out and he killed the, the collins family uh he escaped from a prison bus so that, i wasn't paid um and i know that well, all the appearances at bill cannon and and um uh, phil grimaldi they make it for free they don't get paid so um who knows it's it's unknown do you see anything in the chat because ed you're always scanning like a computer in the chat yes i see people uh making fun of uh the song uh, "One Night in Bangkok." There you go, bingo. It's yeah. it's all good. Uh, but let's keep. Is that the original on. version or the Mike Tyson version? <laughs> yeah, we, we we can't we can't be singing that on here. We'll get a we'll get a copyright strike. Mm -hmm. Ed, should we let somebody call in? What do you think? I'm gonna let you uh, make. Sure. The yeah, I'm I'm getting tired though. I'm dr my battery's draining fast. Okay, so while we have you, we, it's only the 28-minute mark. We'll, we'll try to end this at 40, 40 minutes. Uh, I think that's fair. Um, Team Brittany is in the chat. Lorna McKenzie's laughing. Dr. Ed Moskowitz, uh, I'd get lost in the city, says Lucretia, the joy catcher. All right, let's do it. Uh, I, I want to just preface this. To keep it to what we're talking about, uh, this new evidence, this um, uh, information that uh, Banfield released. Um, let me share and invite Ed is checking the Hang Sang again. Um, he's busy. He's got a lot going on there. Don't forget, yeah, Ed thanks. Wallace is, is he's got a program that he's running there. He's teaching over there. So he's busy. Um, okay, that's not the one I wanted to highlight. There it is. All right. Come on in. Ask us questions in regards to this. And while we're waiting, I'm going to play this second piece as she doubles down with um, – with um, Joseph Scott Morgan. I'm just going to listen to a little bit of it because I didn't get a chance to listen to this. So let's play it while we're waiting for someone to call in. ...that is coming to us uh, from sources close to the investigation. It really does fly in the face of what the coroner had reported earlier. Is it possible that both things can be true at the same time, what the coroner said and what these sources have said? Well, good to be back with you, Ashley. Yes. The, the short answer is yes. When I listened to what the coroner uh, shared, those are very, very general terms. Ed, it says here he investigated over 400 homicide cases. Um, that seems to be a lot. That's a lot of homicide cases, no? In 33 years? Uh, well, I don't know how long he was in homicide, uh, um, in, in, in the homicides uh, unit in Houston. In Houston so. yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. That's yeah. a big number. Yeah. Anyways, oh, Houston is not Houston is a high crime area. So, yeah, but we—I mean, we were experiencing twenty-two hundred 
a year in 1991. And I asked Bill Cannon about that um, about a month ago because I've seen this guy on. I like him. I, I like him. But it's like that's a that's a lot of homicides to investigate. Um, and Bill was like, I, I haven't even investigated, uh, you know, that many. <laughs> Right, terms, very common, very general comments. So, uh, and now we're talking about specifics. So, yes, in the in the in the big picture of things, mm -hmm. both of those statements are going to be accurate. Hallway, is it partially out into the hallway? Is it possible that maybe the attack began there, but then ended um, in? the bed and forensically speaking, and I'll get Joseph Scott Morgan to add to this in a moment, um, they would be able to tell, the murder investigators would be able to tell? I think so. I, I had talked about this before that it's it's certainly possible that the evildoer, I will not say his name, um, did not know about Ethan being present in the house. So he is going to be kind of like a, a Ron Goldman, Nicole Brown situation where he has collateral damage. He has to address the fact that he has an unknown present in front of him. So I don't think that he is, uh, when he gets to Ethan and makes that attack, it is certainly possible that he falls back into the bedroom, onto the bed, and then Xana at that point understands that there is something going on. She may already be awake as Ethan is. And then once he has taken care of Ethan, then he goes after Zana and she is awake and aware. And this is all guesswork, folks. Nobody knows this because he wasn't it's all there. speculation. This is all speculation, you know, and, and this is why I don't like it because how are we, and again, no discredit to the guests here, but how are we to, as the consumer of this, right? How fair is this to any of us when this is just one of many possibilities? He doesn't know that this is how this went down, but he's speaking about it like he knows. And I, this is where I get troubled by this. Which gives her the ability to put up a heck of a fight. And unfortunately, of course, it, it turned out the way it did. So I would say that if the information that you've received is correct, is accurate, that it certainly falls in line with with what we were told in very general terms at the beginning of this, and then what the evidence, as far as I was concerned, had led me to speculate on. So yes. So Joseph Scott Morgan, um, I was I was trying to be as as. You see the look on Joseph Scott Morgan's face as she went to him. Did anybody catch that little smirk that he did right there? Watch his watch mm -hmm. here. Watch Joseph Scott Morgan when she goes to him. Um, I was right I there. was trying to be as as tender. Me to speculate on. So yes. So Joseph Scott Morgan, um, I was I was trying to be as as tender as possible with the um, coroner in asking the nature of the. This is before we ever knew anything about the nature of the the stabbings, and I asked if any of the victims had been slashed, um, and she seemed to be very clear that these were all stab wounds. But these sources are saying that you know, Ethan had been um, slashed, that his neck had been slashed, and that that was the original injury he received. I guess the same question for you. Can those two things still be true? Can a coroner consider a slash a stab? No. If, if her assessment was made merely by what she saw at the scene, uh, I'd say, yeah, they could be true. Those two things could be well, true. Well, I'll stop you right there. I asked her that. I asked her that. I said, were you present um, for the autopsies? And she said, yes. No, I said at the scene, if if she made that assessment at the scene, just to be very blunt with you, these injuries are going to be encrusted with blood. It's hard to make that assessment at the scene. However, however, if she went to the post, this would have been easily, easily visualized at that point in time. And not only, not only is the injury to the neck a slash, allegedly, according to this person, but these injuries that you're talking about on the hands, these are going to be incised wounds as well. Not necessarily slashes, but this is as a result of grabbing hold of the blade and pulling it through the hand. These are not stab wounds. I can tell you that definitively based upon my experience. So, yeah, there probably are some stab wounds, but that information is, it, 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 you need more clarity here as to what she's saying. And that's, I, I guess, at the end of the day, it's not really the point. 
uh, I would draw into question what kind of exam was conducted on site at the scene. When I've yeah. always wondered, when did she actually get access to the bodies? And how now he's a legal medical death investigator, so he knows what kind of exam goes on at the at the scene. It's 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 not it's not very detailed. Um, but uh, again, we have Barbara Butcher, who is a legal medical death investigator. She comes on with us on a regular basis. And I talked to her just yesterday. So we're going to have her come on and we, we have to have her come on and revisit this. Uh, I have Rock and Robin on. Uh, so as soon as she somehow gives me some kind of signal that she, everything's OK, just enable your camera for a second so I can see you. Give me the thumbs up, and then we'll uh, add you on for your question. All right, cool. All right, if you want to switch back, you can. Okay, there you go. She was quick. Uh, Rock and Robin, thank you for joining Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed. Ed is uh, fielding some messages, so I got him off screen right now. What's your question for us? But he's listening. Okay, thank you for letting me up. I kind of have two questions. Okay. Uh, the first one, the easy one, was there any other suspect other than Brian that they looked at, or was he their one and only suspect? Okay, so that's a tough question to answer because you made it as it was easy. Um, it's hard for us because we don't have access to the case file and we don't know about the uh, investigation behind the scenes, right? So that would be a guess and speculation. I would imagine in an investigation of this magnitude that they may have had uh, more than one suspect or may have looked at in more than a few different people here. Remember, we early on, we, uh, I'm talking we as the public, we saw that grub truck video and we were suspect of the guy who came on the scene, right? Hoodie guy. Um, so uh, that Robin, again, that would be a, a, a guess on both Ed and I as investigators. I would guess and say, yeah, that they had maybe more than one. But when, when you have um, an eyewitness that we were not privy to early on and they in interviewed her, right? DM. Um, and she gave that partial description because he had, you know, face coverings. And yeah, so the ski mask. Um, so when they, two weeks into this thing, when Pullman campus police got that 2015 Hyundai, we know, now know that he was on their radar two weeks into this thing. I think so. the car is amazing that they narrowed in on the car and that really kind of did it. Um, you know, that really kind of helped narrow it down. Right. Um, but I want to know how one person can do this to four people and not um, have these like serious wounds or this fighting or like, were they incapacitated? Like, I don't understand how one person can go into a house and do this to four people. I'll let Ed take that because he's investigated uh, over 2,500 He's been to over 2,500 crime scenes. So get it. Well, again, you know, this is, you know, speculation on, on, to some degree, but based on some experience, you know, if, if the first two victims were in fact um, asleep uh, at the time of the attack, um, okay, so they didn't see it coming. Um, apparently, you know, I don't know what to believe with this Banfield report, but if, if um, we do know that at least one of the victims had defensive wounds, so that would suggest that uh, they were um, awake and uh, at the time of the attack and tried to fight back uh, or, or defend themselves um, or fend off the attack. Um, you know, the, the people like this, uh, you know, again, there, there appears to be a lot of rage here, uh, a lot of deep-seated um, psychological issues um, that are probably be better suited for a forensic um, psychologist or psychiatrist, uh, people who do um, behavioral profiling uh, could give you m more detail about, you know, suspects like this. Uh, right. It bothers you know, me why he narrowed in on those four and there were actually six people in the house, correct? Yes, yes. Well, yes. we're going to have Dr. Joni Johnston come on, and she's going to talk next week about the you know forensic psychology side of this, because we had her on, Ed, if you can recall. Uh, we had her on when there was no nobody in custody. So she she graced us with her presence for an hour, and um, I, I believe this week coming up, we're going to have her on. Uh, I'm, I'm 
I'm almost certain that Ed's not going to be available because it's going to be nighttime here and daytime for him. So he'll be working. Uh, but we're going to ask her the questions, these hard questions like this, you know, what, what makes somebody like this tick? And I, I consulted with, um, John, um, uh, I forgot his last name, but he runs uh, Active Cell Protection. Um, John Korea, thank you, Ron, came to my mind. So I consulted with John Korea, Active Cell Protection, and he has a YouTube channel. I think it was like six million subscribers, or a, ho a whole bunch of million subscribers. Uh, and he's really busy; otherwise, he would come on with us. But he did speak with me by email about knife attacks and how quickly and deadly knife attacks can be. And how yes, I don't understand do. how he was able to do that and oh. then leave two other people behind. Right, Robin. So what, what I was going to say is I proposed this question to him and I asked him, uh, you know, how quickly can someone, if they're proficient with uh, an edge weapon, uh, can, can accomplish this task? And he said very quickly. Uh, so at the end of the day, we don't know who how this was done and how quickly he was able to get it done and how uh, we know that and he was in and out of that house so and, and a knife attack is very personal okay um the act of stabbing something somebody uh, you know you got to get up up close and personal um to do this and and the amount of stab wounds the rage that was um, apparently demonstrated with the amount of stab wounds that, that are evident on these victims um goes a lot into the psyche of the killer OK, um, so, you know, like I said, a, a full psychological workup is going to be done on this guy, um, both right. the defense team and the uh, prosecutors. But there is no I understand there is no um, uh, in Idaho. There is no um, defense of. Uh, For, yeah, based you, upon, there's, yeah, there's no insanity, please. No insanity oh, defense. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So you can't you can't uh, plead uh, mental defect or mental illness. They make you right. You yeah. See? And he was a law student and a very good one. Yep. Absolutely. All right. We got another call. All right, thank okay. you, gentlemen, for answering my questions and my prayers to the family. Absolutely. Families. Thank you, Rock and Robin. Thank I love you. your screen name as well. Thanks. Bye bye. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Who do who do we got up? Oh, Ed. It's one. It's your favorite guest. Look who's here. Sleuthy. Hang on, Sleuthy. Hang Good morning, on, Sleuthy. Sleuthy. Hang on. Yeah, 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 Good morning yeah. to you guys. Good evening good from here. Good morning and good night. Hey, how yeah. are you, Sleuthy? Hey, hey, thanks for all the great work that you're doing on Twitter. It's almost midnight here. Twitter Spaces. Oh, Ed is a, to sleep. Ed's a party animal. Mm -hmm. He's going to be up till three a.m. He answers questions till three in the morning on our our comment section. Who are you trying to kid, Ed? He's going to start well, getting yeah, loopy. Okay. <laughs> Ed, did yeah, you? Did, I definitely got to go to bed. Did you look up the, <laughs> uh, the, the Idaho thing, the uh, eight piece? Evidence yes, I did. did. Yes, I need to I know. did. I found it. I found it. Well, yeah. well. I'm shocked. Okay, so I'm going to tell you, you blew my mind uh, the day you showed, uh, you spoke about it on the show. And then when I went and looked at it, and I, and I, I contacted a few of my friends in the lab in the NYPD, and I was like, "Can you have you ever seen this? Have you ever heard of this?" And can, can everybody we, was can shocked. You tell the audience what you're referring to, Ed, here, because some people might be like, "What in the hell are they talking about?" Sleuthy uncovered a document for, um, from the. Uh, Idaho State Lab about um, submissions of uh, DNA evidence and how many pieces you could submit and how uh, you have required to consult them. And uh, I, I, it was something that I have never seen in my entire forensic career. And I and I, it, I totally blown away by it, by it when she first um, brought it to our, my attention. And then after the show, I went and found it, downloaded it, and I sent it to a bunch of people. And they said they'd never seen anything like this. And the only thing people could come up with is that, you know, must be a budget constraint issue uh, in the laboratory uh, that would come out with such a policy of how many samples can be tested and um, when to send and so forth and so on. Look at Car Guy. Look at Car Guy. He puts all comes down to the bucks. Yeah, but they got a million dollars, though, from the governor. I was expecting him to come back and say, you're absolutely wrong. And I'll explain to you how it's actually supposed to be read, you know? 
which just seems so it, crazy. I mean, yeah, it does. It does. But I guess, like I said, I mean, he threw a million dollars just for this investigation because it, mm -hmm. it, 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 he probably knew it was going to be well and well above their budget that they currently have. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I do have a question, though, regarding what you, got, you all are talking to or about. Um, Cause I've, I've had it really with Banfield. Um, but the defensive wounds, you know, she was reading it. Um, and I think it was very much meant to play on emotions. It was made to have you envision what is essentially defensive wounds. And, and I think that if in the beginning, when this was first talked about, when her dad came out, Zana's dad, like the first couple of days and said she had defensive wounds on her hands, if there was a better explanation about what defensive wounds actually are, it wouldn't have been such a shock. Do you know? I, I feel like people were expecting like bruises, like she was punching this person as opposed to slits, mm. I guess, as best I can explain. Like I had pictures, but I wouldn't, I didn't post because it's really, it's, it's shocking, but um, yeah, isn't and, that normal? Ed, Ed's definitely seen this stuff at crime scenes that he's been at where people are straight out stabbed with puncture wounds and then the Cuban necktie, I mean, from ear to ear. Well, those, you, know, you, ha you, have, you have your slicing type wounds and then you have your stab or puncture, puncture wounds um, and they leave, you know, distinct damage to um, tissue and muscle and so forth uh, associated with the the way the knife was actually being used. Um, and any pathologist worth their salt uh, um, upon postmortem examination can tell you, uh, you know, what type of injuries these are. Uh, you know, but she's a coroner and she didn't do, um, she may have went to the scene and looked afterwards, but um, she didn't do the actual autopsy. That was done by a medical examiner in Spokane, Washington. So I, when I initially saw um, the coroner's uh, interview with Banfield, um, I thought there might be some mistake in her um, in her words that she chose to use right. uh, and in her descriptions of, of the injuries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know. Well, she said, yes, um, the, the victims were in bed. Uh, well, she, you know, she didn't put a number on that. She didn't say how many victims were in bed. She didn't, you know, elaborate. She said, were the victims in bed? Well, yeah, some of them were in bed, but she, you know, so first of all, she never given that interview that, that in and of itself, that just blew me away that, that interview, that given that kind of detail out well before a case goes to trial, oh, well, you know, should never have happened. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. it was pre-autopsy, so I, I really don't understand why. I like I wouldn't even interview her pre-autopsy. Number one, um, not being the person that was actually going to perform the autopsy, and number two, I, I found it interesting that you could even come up with a determination of of cause of death. I mean, the manner might have been obvious, but how you could come up with a cause of death when the autopsy hasn't been back yet. Um, my other thing is about the the moving of the bodies. So if you went in and you were processing a scene, if there were obvious signs that a body had started in one place and ended up in another to where you finally now see them where they rest as you walk in, would mm -hmm. you put that in like in the affidavit that you would that you would go to use? Would you mention where they are but not mention, you know, it looked like there were drag, dragged. So you know what I mean. I, I don't. I don't know on why that kind of specificity would be needed uh, for okay, yeah. for an affidavit. But if you know, it's that's a part of your reconstruction of the events. Um, mm -hmm. So and there's usually blood stain patterns um, and other evidence that would uh, support um, that that this person uh, was attacked here and the movements uh, led from the attack point to where we find a body now. Um, and that all has to be supported by the forensic uh, evidence, the bloodstain pattern analysis and, and so forth. I just feel like before I jump down, I feel like since that is the case, it could help identify when and where this leak came from, right? Because essentially, 
if they had moved, if it had started in the hallway and it had moved elsewhere, that wouldn't have been determined until after they had done the reconstruction. So it would mean someone recently was leaking. Yeah. It's just a shame. We're going to talk to Andrea Burkhart. She's great. She's funny. I, I wouldn't want to debate her. Um, but she's going to try to explain like how to, how this stuff could affect, like how these particular leaks could affect appeals and stuff afterwards, more so than arguing over a conflict of interest. So I think that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, criminal defense attorneys are going to have many different takes on this thing. And, and even Joe Murray, you know, our good friend, he's chimed in. He's actually chimed in a little bit uh, in between what Andrea and, 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 uh, you know, the lawyer, you know, he's both to, between the two of them. I mean, I, I just I have so much respect for them. And and, and the third piece, Joe Murray, he's a brother. I mean, I sat down and had dinner with him and his girlfriend. And and for me, I respect all three of their opinions on this thing. And And we could all we can all agree on this. Any and all leaked information that's not supposed to be out before a trial commences is defense attorneys that's it's it's their it, it goes to their uh, help it helps them you know and yeah. who the hell wants to help somebody defend a, a person who is alleged to have killed four college students so i i you know again i'm so against this because we want to see justice served and we want to see it done fair right. and impartial and it, we can't you can't get fair and impartial if everybody's getting all the data the data if you show and expose your cards, then this whole this whole process is fucked. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think what bothered me the most was this is evidence that's gonna come up in trial. And it's like now you're telling me that it's absolutely true. So that's worrisome, especially yeah. if it's not. I have Banfield's uh, interview, and it's only two minutes uh, from when. Oh, she I thought you had her up here calling in. She. When she. Oh my God! If she <laughs> when she interviewed this coroner. Uh, this is only two minutes, but she like grilled her like she was on the stand and got and like put her into a corner. And I was even grimacing then. I didn't like this then. And, and Ed didn't like mm -hmm. it either because we knew no. this was so premature. You don't even have a suspect in custody. Now you're just giving an, a defense attorney a banked help. Uh, you're helping. Statement. Yeah. Yeah. Can't they go back yeah. and say, but this is what you said on this date? This is what you said on this date on TV. They're going to show that she's incompetent on mm. you know, on the stand with this. And, 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 and what's important? Yeah. Go ahead. It's, what's important is that she's responsible for the security of the body, right? So, as far as all the evidence processing, if it's as she is the one responsible for making sure it's as close as possible to before anybody entered the scene, right? Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, listen, Ed worked with Barbara in his, in her office. He didn't work. With the, well, you did. Did you run into her out in the field? You had to have Ed, right? Yeah, no, I, I first met Barbara when she was um, the newly assigned medical legal death investigator. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we worked, we worked homicide body scenes together. Yes, absolutely. And she went out and, and I would, I would in fact, I would, you know, before I left the crime scene office, it was my responsibility when I was rolling on a homicide body on the scene to call the medical examiners to make sure the death investigators were in route so that we can coordinate our efforts. But and, could yeah, you so I worked many difference? scenes. Can you explain the difference between a coroner and a legal medical death investigator like Barbara? Please. And a well, medical examiner. A coroner is an, I mean, we've had this conversation numerous times, but a coroner is an elected official and they could have um, no medical background whatsoever and just be elected to that position. And in some jurisdictions, based on the size of the population of the county and, and, and certain uh, states, um, the elected sheriff is the uh, also the elected coroner. Um, now, in this case, in Idaho, the coroner is uh, has some nursing um, background and, and a uh, lawyer who does the defense work. OK, um, so she was apparently elected to, to, to this position. And um, now, in this case, most coroners are not MDs or medical doctors or pathologists. And so uh, they would have to send their bodies for autopsies. And um, many times these autopsies are performed by a hospital um, pathologist, not necessarily a certified forensic pathologist. Um, and in um, 
in many of these coroner jurisdictions, they have uh, deputy coroners uh, or um, or scene investigators, deputy coroner scene investigators. Okay. Um, now again, it, it, the the training and experience of these uh, death investigators are are varied. Um, and so you could have some that have medical backgrounds and, you know, such as, uh, you know, a, a nurse or uh, EMT, uh, EMS, uh, emergency medical service or paramedic or something like that. And some that have none, maybe just a college degree in criminal justice and um, or the forensic degree in anthropology or something like that. Uh, or and, they work um, in a yeah, there's a lot of funeral home people. That's correct. Right. But, you know. But there is a, you know, there are organizations like the uh, American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigations, AMBDI, or something like that, I believe, right, that provides a lot of training and certifications um, for for these people. And um, now the medical examiner's office, okay, is usually run by a forensic pathologist, and um, the the autopsies are obviously conducted by forensic pathologists and. In the case of New York City, uh, when it first started out, in order to be a medical, a me what's called a medical legal death investigator, um, Dr. Hirsch hired uh, physician's assistants. Okay. Uh, now the standards have uh, changed a little bit so they can hire physician's assistants, they can hire um, registered nurses or nurse practitioners, uh, they can also uh, hire. Um, non-medical degree personnel, but uh, who have been trained by the AMBDI and have uh, certifications from them in death investigations. Wow. Amazing. I, I mean, you know, people just lose track of this is that across the country and Barbara spoke loudly about this early on when we, when I first had her on with, with us, how low these standards are and how people like, look, look what happened with Chad Daybell. He was able to take his wife out of his home and say through the coroner, say his wife died of a natural of natural causes. And they buried her and bombed her and, and, and put her in the ground. Uh, and, and thankfully they got a court order and they removed her and found out that she was killed. So that wouldn't happen in New York city because of the legal medical death investigators like Barbara Butcher. She would have seen that uh, pink frothy, frothy foam coming from Tammy Daybell's mouth and said, whoa, 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 no, no, this is not a natural death. Uh, that didn't happen. They scooped her up, put her in a body bag, took her to the, took her to the funeral home, and they had a funeral for her and buried her. Um, frustrating, and it's crazy. And I said this, and I'll say it again. I don't ever want to get killed outside of my home area here because if I do, then I don't know if I'm going to get a fair shake. Um, and I want to I want to thank you for taking out the time. I'm going to play this last piece with um, Banfield interviewing the coroner. And what's really crazy here is that Banfield, I think, asks her how many murder scenes she's investigated in this piece. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ed. But she actually interviewed her and asked her, how many multiple murders have you had? And she went and answered the question. And she said, oh, I only had one or two, but they were in two separate locations, like a murder or suicide, like, you know, a husband or a wife, and then went to another location and killed. Crazy. What's What do you got up on the screen? Master Blower? Yes, yes. She says the victims were autopsied in Spokane. Yes, we said that. They, they were sent out of state uh, for... Um, the autopsy to be formed by a forensic pathologist from the Spokane Medical Examiner's Office. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Uh, Sleuthy jumped off. She rudely said goodbye to us quickly and left. I'm only kidding. I'm sure she had some motherly duties to do. She's a mom. So thank you, Sleuthy, for coming up and, and asking some questions. Um, it's always great to have. I, we love to get questions that are related to topics that we speak about. And in this video, we talked about the new evidence from sources uh, released by News Nation's Banfield uh, in the University of Idaho uh, murder case. Uh, you're joined here by Ed Wallace and myself. And if you're not yet subscribed, consider hitting the subscribe button, hit the red subscribe and notification bell. Also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, all one word, Duty Ron. Uh, we want to thank everyone in the chat who has 
asked us these questions. Um, we couldn't do this without you guys. And if you care to continue the conversation, leave us some questions down below in the comments section. Look for a video with me and uh, the wonderful Dr. Joni Johnston this week on um, the psychological end of Brian Kohlberger. We want to have her thoughts. I'm going to ask her to go over his writings over at the sales university. Ed, I know you've seen his questionnaires and, and, and I want to ask you because, you know, you, you, I think you know about some of this stuff. Is that part of the curriculum that each student that goes through that program is required to do? Or is this something that is over and above? Because I get that question a lot and I, have well, a I don't the curriculum. I don't, I don't know for sure because, um, you know, I've never studied that curriculum or know what they expect of their um, grad students at the master's degree for, for this. But I do know the FBI's behavioral science uh, program um, in the course of their instruct, instructions for their agents make them do exactly what he did and have very similar, if not the same, questionnaire. Right. Yeah. So well, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Joni Johnston about that. And, and, you know, I'm curious if the responses to those questionnaires, you know, the questions, if those are recorded and investigators have access to that, because it would be interesting to see if there was some replies to that. Uh, and, and, and maybe perhaps, and, and this is me trying to think as a civilian and maybe Kohlberger, um, conducted this these murders in, in with some suggestions from that survey that he that he put out there on the internet oh, I definitely so, think he was using it I definitely think he was using it to guide him in his actions and um, you know uh, yeah. I'd like to see a little more background investigation on that especially with the the BTK um, you know yeah so, see how that you know how that plays out if there was any correspondence. Right. Um, okay. So, yeah. Hey, right, Ron. Ed, thank you. Brother. I'm wiped. All right. Well, I'm going to end it with that. And me and Ed are going to, we'll end it here because we did, we did talk quite a bit about it. And me playing that piece uh, from Banfield interviewing the coroner, I think it's a, you guys could go back and look at it. It's from November 17th. Uh, I'll just show you if you're looking for it and you want to see it. If this is it. It's labeled coroner. Idaho college students were likely sleeping. And this is Banfield. It's a three minute, um, it's a three minute piece. Um, and Ed and I, were, we've played it on this channel. I played it in its entirety. I'll link it down below in the description. And again, thank you on behalf of Ed Wallace and Crime Time with Duty Ron for everyone joining. Uh, I want to just say this. It's, this is about the victims, Ethan Chapin, Zaina Canodal, Kaylee Gonzalez, Maddie, Madison Mogan. These are the important parts of this case, not the news and information and rumors and controversy and drama all of that shit means nothing what means something is getting justice for the crime that was perpetrated against these four victims and that's what we have to concentrate on most and that's what we do here on crime time with duty ron we concentrate on supporting the families and the victims to get justice for them so that being said, Ed, thank you so much for taking out your evening, your Saturday night into Sunday morning in Bangkok, which is not the capital of China. Uh, I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you being here, brother. Beijing, Beijing, Bangkok, Beijing, Bangkok. I can see how Just you made a mistake. Movie. Go watch the gosh darn movie. I know, I know, I know. Yes, Hold yes, on. yes. Oh, hell no. All right, here's one for me. Duty yeah. Ryan, you are. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ed. Uh, so let's uh, everybody watch the, um, the outro because it's got beautiful little Kara and Oscar and Bob by in it. It's our security detail. So Ed, I know you got one final thing to tell everybody. Yes, folks, stay safe, stay prepared. Watch your six. Peace and love from crime time with duty, Ron and Ed Wallace. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you for joining.